Hey there, this is Matt Brown coming at you with another IoT hacking video. Today we are going to be dumping firmware using JTAG from a Raspberry Pi microcontroller that is on the DEF CON 30 badge. We will then modify that firmware and re-upload it to the device and prove that we can successfully modify firmware as well using JTAG. Uh, would like to thank everybody who has commented and subscribed to my previous videos. Really encouraging. Uh, please tell me in the comments, continue to, what I can continue to improve on in these videos, what type of topics you'd like to see in these videos in the realm of IoT hacking. So with that said, we are going to hop over to the desk and check out what we're going to be looking at today. So first, I'm going to swing my microscope out of the way and just look at what we have on the desk. So on the desk today, I've got my DEF CON 30 badge. Uh, DEF CON was awesome this year, had a great time. And it was an electronic badge that was based around the Raspberry Pi's new microcontroller. So we're going to he go ahead and actually take a look at this and see what what's going on on this board. So I will hop over to my microscope camera here and let you see what I see. Get this focused. So here on the board we see that we actually have two chips right next to each other. We first have the Raspberry Pi microcontroller right here and then we have an external flash chip. So this is going to be really important for us to understand as we continue into using JTAG to dump this firmware because the important firmware that runs on this board is actually not on the microcontroller itself. Uh, I believe this microcontroller does support a, a limited amount of uh, internal flash but the the code that's actually like running the bulk of the the programming on this board is housed on this flash chip and so we are going to want to dump that off for our modification so with that i'm going to flip this board over and we're going to take a look at a very useful port that we have located on the back of this board uh, if you have done any type of uh, JTAG work or uh, microcontroller debugging or ARM debugging in the past, you will note that this is a very common 10-pin uh, ARM debug connector. And I also happen to have a corresponding uh, pogo pin connector. And I'm going to show this under, under the microscope because it's a lot easier to see. Um, that actually interfaces with the with this uh, with this connector, and I can even show you the. So the way this works is that so you don't have to solder onto this connector, and then you can see these are just kind of these spring-loaded pins, that when this connector is put onto onto this part on the board, and you apply some pressure, or you just get it into a position where it's not going to move, then you're going to have a solid connection to your debug interface, which is fully open and not protected um, on this board. So I'm going to switch back over to my desk cam, get my microscope out of the way, and I'll kind of show how we're going to connect uh, this to our JTAG port. So. Uh, some of you might be wondering what this is doing here. This is the JTAGulator. If you haven't uh, heard about this tool, this is a really awesome tool that's useful for reverse engineering uh, random pins on a board. So if I didn't know, if I didn't have this nicely labeled, well-known well uh, set of pins here for a debug connection, then I would need to use a tool like the JTAGulator to figure out which debug pins are which, or if I just had a bunch of pins on the board and I don't know which one, if any of them are JTAG, I, the JTAG later could help me assess that situation on the board. But today we're going to set that aside because we have a very common 10-pin arm, arm debug uh, slot here. So 
I, uh, I'm using a JLink here as my debugger, and I'm simply going to put the connector in there, and then I'm actually going to flip it over so that some of that pressure of it sitting like that will keep all those pogo pins exactly where I want them. And then I'm going to power on the device. And when I do that, uh, you'll see, uh, it's probably hard to see, but there's a menu that comes up and uh, you, can, you can play. It's a musical instrument. It's a pretty cool badge. So uh, now that I have my debugger connected, I'm going to go and flip over to my other screen here. So uh, we're going to look at a tuple, couple data sheets here. So if you noticed when I had the microscope over those two chips, those two chips on the boards, I've got both of their data sheets uh, or just product pages sitting up here in my web browser. So here we have the data sheet for our Raspberry Pi. So we're going to need a key piece of information out of this data sheet and it's going to be nicely labeled in this address map section. So what I'm looking for here is this XIP value that stands for execute in place. And so what this address does is this is the address where that external flash chip is going to be mapped in place so it can be directly addressed like any other memory address uh, on the microcontroller. So this is going to be something that I'm just going to copy and then I've got a little text file over here and I'm just going to paste that and save that for later. And then the other thing that we need to know, uh, so again under the microscope we were able to obtain this information the, that was labeled on the chip. So this is our flash chip and then the really, I, I don't even need to open the data sheet. All I need to do for this item is to go down and see the memory size of this device right here. And so we can see that the memory size is 16 megabits. And then, so just so we're ready for this command that we're going to do in the JLink, because the JLink command is going to want to know the number of bytes, not bits. So just some quick math and Python here, we can say 16 million, wait, did I do that right? Million bits divided by eight. That gives us the number of bytes. And then it's going to want that number to appear in hex. So we will just grab that hex value. And again, I'm going to copy that into a text editor I have on another screen. We're going to get that out of there. Um, oh, yeah, one other link I just wanted to show you all. So, again, this is a, a J-Link product and a J-Link connector that I'm using here. This is the 10-pin uh, adapter, and I believe they have, a, they have like a picture. Yeah, so here here's another picture that I kind of tried to show in the microscope of what this connector looks like. Um, again, it's just a, a way to get that specific 10-pin uh, 10 pin pogo pin set up uh, to connect to the JLink debugger. Um, yeah. So with that, I'm actually now going to run the JLink exe command. So this is the command line interface. It's some ki sometimes called JLink Commander. Uh, you'll you'll see it referenced that way a lot online. And so I'm just going to run this, and it's plugged in as a USB device. It recognizes it. And uh, one useful tidbit here is it's actually detecting the reference voltage of the board as being 3.3 volts. Uh, this is just a, a helpful uh, dummy check that you can always do to see if the pogo pins are somewhat connected. I mean, if they're not connected, having a good connection with the board, you'll often see that this is zero volts, and then any of the commands you try to do after that are, are not going to not going to really do anything for you and not going to work. So, uh, but I do, it, the board does detect a reference voltage of 3.3 volts, which I know to be correct on the board. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to type the connect command. And although I already have the Raspberry Pi microcontroller pre-selected, I'm gonna show you what this dialog looks like. When I hit the question mark 
or when I send the question mark, I can search through this for all the different types of microcontrollers and other uh, CPUs that the JLink supports in debugging. And uh, But for the Raspberry Pi one, I can just search Raspberry Pi, and it only supports this one from Raspberry Pi. Because as far as I know, this is the only microcontroller they make. So I'm just going to select uh, this first uh, device model. I'm going to say OK. Uh, honestly, for the second, this, this choice here, it's going to tell me what type of target interface. Uh, again, since this is an ARM device, I mean, uh, um, SWD is always a good option, but you could do JTAG also, and it would probably work. I'm going to use the default speed that it wants to use, and it is giving me some kind of an error. That's interesting. So I'm going to try to reset the board and then see if I can halt the CPU, and I can, I can halt the CPU. And so this is, this is a sign that uh, my, my debug connection is operating correctly, and then I can also like run this command like is halted, and it actually says the CPU is halted. So, um, and then yeah, I can show you that by jumping back over to my desk and, and seeing that if I, it's kind of hard to see, but if I click this button, it actually isn't doing any, doing anything. This debugger has, has completely halted the operation of code on this device. So now we will jump back to my screen. And now what we want to do is we want to dump the firmware off of this device. So I'm going to do the question mark to bring up all these commands. So the command we are going to use to dump the firmware is this save bin command. So uh, this save bin command, we're going to just start typing out save bin. So it wants a file name, so we're just going to call it firmware dump dot bin. Let's just call it whatever you want. And then for the address, that's where that you know, one with all the preceding zeros comes from that address where that execute in place, uh, uh, yeah, where that where that execute execute in place address is, and then uh, the command there it is, yeah, uh, number of bytes. Okay, and that's where that value is that we kind of calculated in Python. So that's based on the size of the external flash chip, which is uh, 16 megabits converted to bytes and then converted to uh, hexadecimal. So with that we can hit enter and it will it will read into a file that memory and then it says okay it says it's done so we are going to just exit out of that for a second and here we have a firmware dump file that is the correct size that we expected it to be and then we can even you know, run a hex editor and kind of look at some of the code. And let's see what's going on here. It seems to have not read anything at all. Well, that's fascinating. You know what? I think it has to do with how I halted the CPU. So we're going to. We're just going to try that again. All right, I'm just going to save bin. We're going we're, we're to try that again. Actually, I'm going to turn it off and on again. And then we're going to run the command even again. Could not read my ring. All right. Connect. There we go. There we go. All right, third time's the charm. There we go. Aha. Okay. So now we have now 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 we have our firmware. So we have now successfully dumped that firmware off the device. And so we'll get, we can go ahead and just kind of like look at a hex dump of it. Um, we can see lots of fun and interesting stuff. And then 
uh, for our modification, we're going to look at, we're going to go ahead and actually look at some of the strings on this device. Um, so just as a proof of concept, this is not going to be an amazing elite uh, firmware dump, but there is a part of this device that just displays the credits of who made the, deba the badge and things like that. So I'm actually going to look for this string. So we can see in here there's these strings uh, yeah, in, 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 intermixed like in, in, in this binary with other data. Uh, where it says artwork, this person's name, EE -E and code, and this other person's name. And so we are going to go and look back at our desk. And I'll actually show that right now. I'm going to turn it off and on again because who knows what that state that debugger put it in. So I'm going to hit credits. And you can see here it displays on this screen. Uh, those strings that we're seeing from the firmware we dumped. So what we're going to attempt to do is we're going to attempt to replace those strings with our own message in the modified binary. I'm just going to put this back into a good state for when we're ready to push. All right. So with that, I'm going to try to keep that original firmware, and then I'm going to call this other firmware mod.bin. And then I'm actually going to open this up in Vim. And so this is like the very a very crude method of firmware modification. Obviously, if we were trying to modify code, this would in no way work. Uh, another thing I had to do uh, when I was testing this before is I had to add this line to my VimRC. Uh, so it wouldn't add a new line onto the end of the binary file. So with that said, we are going to open this in Vim. So we see a bunch of binary data, obviously, that we would not be able to modify in any useful way. But down here, we can find where that artwork string is and those other strings. So I'm just going to modify three of these, and you'll, you'll see how I'm going to do that. And, I, and I'm going to be really careful when modifying this to, to leave the same amount of bytes in each string. Uh, because we don't want to mess up any addressing of any subsequent strings uh, in code. So I'm going to actually be counting out loud. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you get the idea. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And for the last one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. So if we do that, and then as a quick check, if we ls both those files, that they are the same size, it did not add the new line character to the end of this mod file. So now we are going to go back into our debugger, connect, use the default device, speed is OK. And now we are going to run another command called load file. So load file, you just give it a file name to the, to the firmware file that you want to load, and then the address. So we already know all those values. So we're going to go ahead and type load file. And then the file name is mod, and then the address is 1000, and then four more zeros. And then if all works, it will tell me that it's pushing it to the device. And then we can go back over to our desk. And again, I'm going to turn it off, get it disconnected from the debugger. And now I'm going to turn it on. And if we go down to our credits screen, it will say hacked by NMAT. And so now we have demonstrated today that using JTAG against a Raspberry Pi microcontroller, we are able to both dump firmware and then modify that firmware and push it back onto the device, all using the JTAG port that is available on this. Uh, this is why when I'm performing pen tests, uh, JTAG is something that is, is always on, my, on top of mind for me. 
when I'm looking at uh, yeah, different embedded devices, IoT devices, that's something that you want to disable. If you're a developer of an IoT product, it's an incredibly useful debugging tool to you as a developer. You do need that, but then you have to think about what can an, an attacker do with that same functionality. And so that's why uh, it's really important to disable uh, those types of features or uh, not allow uh, firmware to be read out before it is wiped uh, and, and things like that. You have like write protection, read protection that you can do on microcontrollers. Uh, those security features tend to be uh, specific to the different manufacturers that are out there. Um, so uh, you really just need to check the data sheets of your specific device uh, to figure out how to implement those security controls. So with that, uh, please continue to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what other type of videos you would like me to do, and have an awesome day.